I talked to Antonio Centeno recently from Real Men Real Style. He runs a YouTube channel. He's got millions and millions of subscribers. And we talked a lot about fashion. He gave me fashion advice. The number one piece of advice that he gave me was, don't wear black. It makes you look like a pale ghost. And to that I had to say, I don't own anything that's not black. I got red. If I hold this red next to me, red's also not my color, I don't think. Sitting in front of a white wall, probably also not my color. But this is a good podcast for anyone who is thinking about fashion, how to improve their fashion, especially as a business person. We also talked about how he creates YouTube content, how he's been so consistent with his content over the last few years, how he monetizes his blog. It's almost all ad revenue. And actually that was a huge insight as well from this conversation. He used to sell courses and he still sells a few, but we talk about why he pivoted away from courses and focused almost exclusively on sponsored content. So here we go. My conversation with Antonio Centeno. Ch -ch 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 Check it out. Welcome to the podcast, Antonio. Hey, Alex. Thanks for having me. Of course. I was just listening to your uh, episode with John Lee Dumas on Entrepreneur on Fire. Uh, wow, that was a while backstory. back. Yeah, that was like, what, five years ago, I think? Four years ago, I did that one with him. Yeah, it was it's interesting. Um, I really like his interview style. It's like he's so detached from <laughs> from the entrepreneur, um, at least back then. Yeah, but yeah. I was watching that. Yeah. I watched. A, I, I've been watching a lot of your a lot of your stuff on Mentalential and uh, trying to learn. So it's really cool to have you here. Well, good. Well, I'm happy that you're you're picking up some information there. And yeah, John Lee Dumas is a giant, and he really uh, what he did is amazing. And John John's a great guy. Uh, I met up with him in London uh, just. Was it last year, him and Kate? But uh, we were in Iraq at about the same time. He was an army officer and I was in the Marines. And he actually has got some great stories. He didn't talk about them much, but we had started a business together called High Speed Low Drag to work with veterans to help oh, them wow. transition out. So so he's just a he, he's a stand-up dude and uh, you know, just goes out there and crushes it and makes things happen. Yeah, I love him. I've been on his show twice. I had him on the podcast a couple months ago too. So like, cool. I, I like him. Um, yeah, for sure. So what do you think is the let's talk style first what do you think is like the number one number two thing that people are getting wrong especially men like i'm picturing startup founders like mark zuckerberg types like what are they getting wrong when it comes to style well mark zuckerberg is he's getting it mark zuckerberg kills it when it comes to style he he has a uniform i mean what what's his uniform is it a suit it's that hoodie i mean it's i guess is that style just knowing what the like knowing yes. that somebody's gonna be wearing the same outfit all the time that's style enough so let's get back to your first question, which is what's the big mistake? And the big mistake is most people don't care. And that to me is the issue it, because they would care if they realized it has an effect on how much money they're going to earn, how, what type of a partner they're going to attract, whether that be for a life partner, whether that be for a business partner, because me, people make split second decisions on who you are and, you know, like right now, you got to dress well, at least here in Wisconsin, because it's freezing. It's like negative 40 outside right now. I mean, deathly cold. They, you know, but most of the time people are getting dressed and they have like a wide variety of options. And technically, if you're, I guess, in San Diego, you could even walk around naked. But people don't do that because they realize at a basic level that, okay, I need to put something on. But what they don't realize is if they were to wear the right clothing, depending on what they're, you know, they want to accomplish, they could send a message which would just make their life easier. So when a fireman runs into a room and says, everyone get out, nobody says, what authority are you making? And no, they, they see the fire department, they see that uniform and they comply. Same with the police officer, same with the doctor. You walk, you know, I've got four kids and uh, if they're sick and I walk in and somebody tries to take my kid and they don't, they're not dressed like a doctor or a nurse, I'm not giving them my kid. So it, it is... Style to me and where I really come in, I focus on the science of style and I focus in on giving you a deeper understanding of how you can leverage it as a tool to get what you want out of life. You know, and for most guys that listen to me, it's about earning more. It's about being able to translate that into getting their startup off the ground or to go and, you know, getting that loan for your nonprofit or for being able to go in there and get that job and to be able to get that promotion because you look the part of a success. It's interesting how that that style, like looking a success can change too. Like my co-founder, Robert, is very much the old school, needing to wear a suit, needing to wear a fancy shirt and everything. And I'm sitting here in a hoodie and just chinos or whatever. And I feel like, I, I don't know, I feel as successful as he does, even though we're wearing different clothes. 
<laughs> well, have you tested it? So back when I was selling a bunch like in person, I used to wear very fancy like gingham shirts, very fancy gingham shirts, nice shoes, all of that. I just got so sick of it. I felt like I was dressing just to sell more rather than dressing to be the authentic person that I am. So Alex, who is the authentic person that you are? What does he look like? I think it looks more like it looks more like what Mark Zuckerberg dresses like than what, let's say, a, a traditional lawyer would dress like with a suit and tie and everything. But there's such a wide variety of clothing out there. I mean, you, if you go over to India, you go over to South Africa, you head to Australia, you go over to, I, I don't know, you know, you go to East Timor. I mean, you've just got different people wearing different things. I honestly think most guys haven't thought through it, like what what that successful man who they want to be looks like. And to me, that's what's interesting about style is you start to realize, oh, well, I could I can wear anything. And a lot of this clothing is actually incredibly comfortable if it fits my body and people compliment me uh, when you go out and just simply if you went to go get lunch, you just grabbing a sandwich. And I don't know if you're married or single, but, you know, in any case, you're, you're alive. And I know as a guy that has blood flowing through me, I appreciate it. You know, when, when a random woman says, wow, you look good. Uh, you know, it's like me and my friend, we just had to say that you're the best looking guy in this, in this restaurant. I mean, if that hasn't happened to you, wouldn't that be nice if it did? I, I mean, it, it makes you feel yeah, good. It makes you feel great. And that's where I want clothing for guys to understand that it can be that tool. It can be the conversation starter. If you were to get into watches, you're sitting at the airport and the guy next to you, you notice he's wearing a Rolex. Now you wouldn't have noticed that if you didn't collect watches yourself. And you notice he's not just wearing any Rolex, but one from 1965. And it's, you know, wow, that's, that's, you know, that's one of the Rolex Explorer. That was one of the earlier versions that was based off of Sir Edmund Hillary when he climbed Mount Everest. And then we first started coming out with that watch the year after that. All of a sudden you start talking with this guy who's right next to you, who looked like a normal guy, except for that watch. And you realize he's the CEO of a multi-million dollar company. And that's where style you start speaking a language, you start noticing these small details and you start, I think it just opens up the door to more opportunity. That is interesting because about six months ago, I started studying style more in depth. And like before that, I was wearing pleated pants still. Like my my pants were huge. No one said anything for like two years. And now I finally am wearing clothes that fit me more. But yeah, I think it, it is what you're saying with the Rolex watch, right? Like there is an entire group of people that are into style. It was only through doing a little bit of research that I even started noticing brands that people are wearing because <laughs> they just didn't stand out, especially the very high end stuff. You know, it, it, and style is a lot of people, they think runways and, or they think, and I think that's where a lot of guys don't care about it. Cause what do you care what's going on on a runway? It doesn't even make sense. And I agree. And what I care about is craftsmanship. What I care about is attention to detail. What I care about is excellence. What I care about is things that really start to change. And when you get into watches or you get into shoes, you start to realize, well, I mean, if you know the history of boots and shoes, actually with the, the blucher, uh, it's a classic men's now dress shoe. But back whenever that shoe came out, this was, it was named after a, after a general that was able to equip his men with an inexpensive piece of footwear that enabled them to march farther and basically execute their mission and kick butt. And when you realize, well, that's the history of good shoes. Now we take it for granted. All of us have pretty much good shoes, but you know, go back 300 years. Most armies were not equipped with good shoes. And that was the difference maker between being able to go over and make things happen and, you know, take over a country or being the ones taken over and things like that. Really, I find interesting and they're great stories, but they also go to show it's the people that are interested in this stuff usually are going for more. They're, they're the hustlers. They're the guys out there making things happen. When you look at, again, I keep going back to watches, but you look at you know us going into space and you look at how certain watches had an effect and, and you took a watch up to space or if you're going to climb the highest mountain or if you're going to be deep sea diving why it is certain watches need to be able to work at those, uh, you know, at those depths and pressures. What do you think are some, some red flags that your style isn't good? Red flags that your style isn't good. Red flags. Say, like, yeah, yeah. No, I'd ahead. say you're not getting compliments. 
that you don't really, that you don't love what you're wearing. I, I think a guy should be able to walk into his closet and be able to have the problem of not that he can't find anything or not that he can't put anything together, but simply he sees five things that he would love to wear today. And it doesn't know. it's like, that makes me look like a million bucks. That makes me look like a badass. That one makes me look friggin' awesome. That one, I will get compliments all day and make my wife jealous, you know, and that's, that's your choice. Wouldn't that be nice? Like those are your options versus you're just like, you don't think about it. And yet every guy out there is putting on something in his body. He's not enjoying that part. It's like once you get in nice cars and you start to enjoy the drive, it's it's hard to ride in something that you that you can't like examine or can't or is a bad is a bad ride. It ruins you. And that's what I think with style. Yeah, it ruins you, but it also ruins you in a good way because you start to realize there's a whole world there that you get to explore. Very cool. So I want to talk about your online courses and things like that in a second, but your free content I think is it's so consistent for so long. Like what is your What's your mindset? How do you think about creating content? And yeah, how do you how do you think about delivering the value that you do? Well, I have to admit that my content strategy needs work because we are, uh, you know, sometimes we're not having an overall big strategy and plan, but I do try to provide, I think that guy in transition where I'm thinking like, what would he like to watch? So we create some videos and, you know, YouTubers are our main outlet. We've got well over a thousand videos on that platform. And we've consistently put out videos on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Parts of the year, I kind of ramp that up. Sometimes I'll get six to seven videos a week. But I found that just being able to create that, put it out there is, um, you know, the guy's going to find it. I try to write my titles and put out our information so it can be very SEO optimized. I've also been ultra specific in some of the content that we've created. I find that someone would rather get their problems specifically solved than to be given very general advice. That being said, I try to still... Um, I try, I'm very right brained and I came out at like in college, I studied evolutionary biology. So I have a psychology and bi biology background. I also studied business at the university of Texas. So I try to take concepts sometimes out of the school of Like I just put out a video on cognitive biases, which if anyone knows, you know, that comes out of psychology and economics and human beings have certain cognitive biases that kind of force, they're just things we naturally have a tendency to do. And I try to bring that into style. And that's probably with my content when I'm putting out, I'm always trying to think, how can a guy who's not interested in style become interested in style? So when I can explain to you five reasons why boots will make you more attractive, all of a sudden, you know, for a guy that's out there in the dating scene, he's like, well, well, why wouldn't I consider a pair of boots? Oh, they're going to make you taller. Oh, they're going to you know, oftentimes be made from higher quality leathers and they're just going to hold a shine and look great. And so all of a sudden you start to look at different boots out there and yeah, you start to realize, well, maybe I do care about style because style is simply the tool that's going to, you know, get me get me lucky tonight or it's going to possibly get me a job or possibly even lead to a promotion. Man, I've got so many issues around this, like mentally, because when you were like, wear nicer shoes to appeal more to the women, I was thinking, why don't I, how do I wear like worse shoes? How do I wear the worst shoes possible to not get any attention at all? <laughs> and if that's your, and, and we talked about that too. Like if, so if you understand how to do something, you can also do the reverse of it. You know, so if you want to be behind the scenes, you know, okay, I'm going to wear muted colors, but for you, muted colors, you know, I'm looking at a picture, you know, you've got lighter colored skin, you've got blondish brown hair, you know, so for you, actually, if you were to wear black, it, it's going to work against you and it's going to make you look pale. It's going to make you, it's going to pull out color of your skin. So there are certain colors you would want to wear next to your, to your skin that are actually going to actually mute you better. Black doesn't mute you. Black just makes you look, it's just not a great color for you um, versus other ones that can put you more back there and in a behind the scenes and you can still look good. You could still even wear a jacket. You could wear a nice shirt yet you're not going to, your colors aren't going to, you know, blow out. I'm wearing a black hoodie as we speak. See, I just need to do a little research. I needed to have you on the podcast. I've been, I've been wasting my life. You know, I've been wearing black hoodies for five years now. <laughs> no, I used to wear I mean, bright if, colors. The way I look at it is you just haven't leveraged style and, and you can achieve great success without thinking about this. But you brought up Mark Zuckerberg at the beginning. And when he came off maternity leave, he shared a picture of his closet. And his closet was nothing more than gray shirts and hoodies. And he's like, ready to get back to the, you know, it's like, so what that showed me is that he has a uniform and I push for people to have a uniform because why do you want to spend time thinking about what you're going to wear when you've got bigger things to do? And, and I'm all for that. 
But I, what I do think though, is that if you're going to, if you're going to go ahead and have that uniform, why not spend a little bit of time planning at the beginning, what you want that uniform to, to signal, what, how you want it to, you know, what, how you want the world to look. And I, I do think that that little bit of planning before you go out there is going to save you a lot of headache. There's a company, I, I, I feel really bad. They, they probably should fire someone in marketing. You, you know, Infusionsoft, right? You're familiar with them? Yeah. 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 Did you they see what they changed their name. their name to? I can't remember it. I don't know what it is. It's called, it's a, yeah, this just happened like a couple of days ago. It's called keep K E A P check, log into your uh, urban dictionary and check out what that means. And then you're going to realize <laughs> if they would have thought about before spending a million dollars to rebrand themselves, they would realize probably shouldn't have gone with that. And you know, that's, that's an example of a company that just probably wasted millions of dollars going with a name that is going to plague them for years and be an inside joke. And it, you don't want that to happen to your own personal style that for years, people are like, yeah, you know, he's so, he's so cool. He's so sick. He, he's kicking butt. He's so smart, but my goodness, if you can just get past the fact that he dresses like someone that's going to rob you. Yeah. He, he would have been running so the place funny. two years ago. I'm thinking of that uh, movie director, Kevin Smith. He always used to wear the hockey Jersey for like 10 years. He was just wearing a hockey Jersey every single time. And you could even He's argue like if, if he knew that that is his like thing that like separates him from the crowd, then, then maybe, you know, going into a crowded industry. I was in Austin, Texas just the other day and there's a lawyer. Uh, he's got a big poster board up and he's like, you know, call me if you've got issues. I'm the lawyer that rocks. And uh, he's got facial tattoos face piercings and dreadlocks, <laughs> but he's wearing a suit. And you know what? If I get picked up with, you know, because of possession of an illegal, you know, who am I going to call? The lawyer that is going to look down on me or the lawyer that looks like me and the lawyer that gets me because I've got money and I'm ready to spend it. And I'm going to go with the lawyer that gets me. He controlled his image and he's sending the message he wants to send. Boom. That style. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, my little brother works in a he works in a recording studio and he recently got, it was a nose piercing because basically he's a, like a, not a doorman. He's like an assistant there and he's trying to get the other DJs to notice him and listen to his music. And so he feels like if he looks more like a DJ, they're more likely to ask. And he may be correct there. You know, it's like uh, he speaks the language, he gets it. You know, it's a small thing, but you know, people like to interact and they trust people that look like them. Very cool. Um, okay. So I, I actually did have a question. It's from that entrepreneur on fire interview. And it's actually good that it was so far in the past because I noticed that your course strategy had kind of changed based on what you were saying back then. Uh, back then you were talking more about niche courses. So you mentioned it was style for, for black men, style for lawyers. I think you mentioned one or two other ones, but then when I go on your site, as far as I can see, you just have that one style system and your landing page is appealing to all these different people in the, in the FAQ. So I'm wondering how, how have you evolved on niche marketing? Like how did those little courses do versus this big course? I wish that? I could give you a really great answer here, but it's more of my comp my shift as a company and where I'm making money is really focused. We're actually going in and we're rebuilding our information products. I would still argue that people want to buy courses that are specific to them, but it is a big undertaking when you're, you know, unless you've got someone dedicated to your information products, to actually build all that out. Like our biggest revenue is going to be advertising. It's not going to be information products. When I probably interviewed with John five years ago, probably I would say information products were, were a bigger, at least probably 70% of my revenue. Now they're 10% of my revenue. And they have, you know, it's, and we've just grown in a lot of other areas. And that isn't my number one focus. So I went to the focus of simplification. I simply didn't want to be, going in and looking at four to five different students coming in, you know, four to five different ways. Uh, so those are the other ones we eventually just killed off. Um, and part of that also became like, you realize that you only have so much uh, energy and time that you can spend on certain things. So sometimes you do turn off things. You know, one of some, I've had courses that were actually doing pretty well, making me a good amount of money, but I cut them off simply because there was opportunity in another place to make uh, not only more, but I enjoyed it more. That's interesting. Why did you, um, or how did you come up with that insight to focus more on advertising? I, I would say talking with us, uh, seeing what the advertisers, it, it was probably more of opportunity just falling in. It wasn't, I wouldn't say it was some grand strategy. It was me hosting an event, uh, you know, my Menfluential conference and spending time with other people in my space and realizing that, okay, you know, advertisers are willing to come in and 
spend 5,000, 10,000, 25,000, in some cases, six figures to work with you over the period of a year, multiple times. And so it's a, it's a difference of like bringing whales into your company and hunting whales versus before you're hunting minnows. Uh, so you're going, you know, if you're selling a $27 or a $7 product, you have to sell a lot to make $5,000 or $10,000 uh, or $100,000 versus if you have an infrastructure and we brought it, we have a sales guy. Uh, and I started another company called Menfluential Media, which is much more profitable now than, than my company, Real Men Real Style. And I do a lot less work and I make, I get a good amount of money from it. So, you know, it's all of a sudden you create these things that really force you to rethink the way that you're doing business. Uh, I'm not saying I could be where I'm at. Like Menfluential Media uh, came about because of my, my, my real men, real style, which came about because of my business before that, a tailored suit, which went into bankruptcy. So it seems like what, what the businesses that come after, you can't like fast forward to them. You still have to go through, in my opinion, the learning process, which you do with other businesses that perhaps you put a lot more time into and you don't make nearly as much money, but they prepare you uh, for the opportunity that eventually comes. Yeah. And it seems, well, it seems like it would be either or because the so you could either advertise your courses on Menfluential Media or you could sell advertising space for millions of dollars because it's the same target market. There are, there are ways around it. You know, you could uh, pay traffic, I think, is a big opportunity. I mean, the year right now is 2019. And I think if anyone's been on Facebook, they see tons of people in their feed, you know, talking about a problem, trying to get in front of the right person to be able to sell you a, uh, a course or a product. Uh, and I do think paid traffic on all the various platforms out there, YouTube, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Though huge opportunity there using paid traffic. How'd you get into advertising? So selling advertising, were you doing the first few sales yourself? Did the first couple of people come to you? Like what was your story there? No, you know, I'd say my, com a lot of people view him as my competitor, Aaron Marino, uh, but he's actually, you know, one of my best friends. We talk, you know, today he's already called me twice, bothers me all the time, sends me pictures <laughs> of his cats and stuff. But uh, no, Aaron's great. And, and I, I love the guy. He is, uh, but, you know, surrounding myself with people, that are awesome and that want to help you. And that's what Aaron wanted to do. He's like, he saw like, cause I would occasionally talk about companies and he's like, well, why don't you charge them for talking about them? And I didn't really feel good about that. I just, it was, I had a mental block there. And so he's like, well, do this, send them an invoice for $3,000. Cause you know, you spent a lot of time on that and, you know, ask them, okay. Cause basically it was a shoe company I talked about and sold them a lot of shoes. And, you know, it took me a long time because I had other things I was working on. It took me like two months to get that review done. And then the shoe company rewards me because after I was so happy, I got it done. I'm like, finally, I'm done. Because uh, those guys had sent me free shoes that were valued at, you know, a, a few hundred dollars. And, uh, and they reward me with sending me another pair of shoes immediately afterwards. <laughs> and I'm just like, and then Aaron said, hey, send him an invoice for three grand. And I was like, okay, uh, you know, I'll try it. Like, because... Honestly, I was at a point that I was like, yeah, if they pay, they pay whatever. They paid in like 30 minutes. And so, boom, it's like you make three grand in 30 minutes for something I would I did for free last time. And then you start, it opens up the idea and the, the thought process in the window to, well, what if you were to, you know, to increase this? What if you not only charge more, but also you get more of these, you start to fit in. And, that, and that's where that kind of went. So that, you know, developed into, you know, a very successful, um, you know, advertising company now called Menfluential Media. I thought you were going to say they sent you $3,000 worth of shoes. No, that would probably be a nightmare. So right? I, shoes, I actually, more and yeah. more shoes. <laughs> I'm the, um, okay. I, I, I get more stuff sent to me than I know what to do with. It's... I also get asked a bunch of times to do software reviews and things like that. And recently I've been asking them uh, to pay before we do the reviews. Is that what happened with this? Or so they sent you the review, you did it, and then you, you asked them to pay after? No. Well, I mean, with that one, they sent me, I'd already talked about the company and their product. And it's like, well, I mean, it's a great product. I'll talk about it, but you know, you, we gotta, you gotta pay for placement in the video. I mean, it's simply, you know, what we do is we, we deliver a great audience to your, and they buy your product. Uh, and you can still, I mean, it's, it's a tough balance because a lot of people, they don't, if they've never sold or they don't know how to sell, or they somehow think that selling, you know, I, a lot of, a lot of people have an issue with sales. And I think that that's um, some type of, it's a mind block that we develop at some point. I think schools don't do a great job of, but you know, we all think of the, the, what is it? The, the slimy car salesman. And that's, I, if you are actually solving a problem, 
you're not like that at all. I mean, you are someone actually out there because everyone's selling something. They're trying to sell you for their time. They're trying to sell you, you know, to get you to do this, to get you to do that. And they're not working for free. And it, it just comes down to simply like I, because I'm able to charge money for things, then I can choose to work for free for certain things I believe in, such as, you know, dealing in, in, you know, tackling the issue of suicide or working with disabled, you know, veterans or, you know, working with Ukrainian orphans because companies pay me money. I'm able to, you know, basically set aside a thousand dollars that goes to this Ukrainian orphan group called Orphans Hope. Now, if I did everything for free, I would not be able to give them any money because I wouldn't have any. And it, it's that, I mean, it sounds very basic there, but that's what I, I love. In addition, it makes people really value what you deliver to them. When they pay 10,000 for a placement in a video, they're going, they're, they're going to be invested in that. They're going to make sure they've got a landing page for you. They're going to make sure that they are, they've got the website up versus if you just do it without even tell, you know, there's no, oh, you know, yeah, the website broke. Yeah. We, we didn't get too many sales because, you know, we, we didn't have, it wasn't working. You know, these things have happened to a lot of people I know that do things for free and it's a fail, fail. Yeah. hundred percent. Do you remember what your traffic was like? So for someone to pay, what do you say? 3,000 for the first video. What was kind of your traffic like? Like how, how do you value that? Because what I've seen from a lot of advertisers is, so our channel is way smaller than yours. I think we have like 23,000 subs, like just a couple thousand views or, or less even per video. And so, I don't know, I've gotten a lot of pushback on pricing. Like they'll pay a hundred bucks, maybe 250, maybe 500. But like $10,000 per video just seems like, I don't know, what do the numbers need to look like to get those kind of rates? Well, it depends on who your audience is. And that's the thing that gets lost in the numbers and how effective you are at getting your audience to do what you ask them to do. So if you've got high trust, you haven't burnt out your audience and you don't do these things very often, to me, you probably have a very high value. And again, like I've got people that talk about high-end watches and to me, they're going to be, their audience is much more valuable than people that talk about hair products. I mean, a hair product and even an expensive one, 25, 30 bucks, uh, a high-end watch that sells for 25, to $250,000. You don't have to sell too many of those to make your money back. So, you know, it, it really depends on who your audience is. And again, the trust. So I like to, I mean, if you don't know the reaction that you can get, like we actually measure how many people we will send to a website. And we, we try to use tracking links. We, we do this internally when we're promoting our own stuff, because I want to be able to see really, even if I'm not, and I don't, you know, I'm not always going to tell the the advertiser, I'm going to promise you this because I, I don't want to make a promise like that because you can't see the future. But what I can do is I can work on myself becoming better at where do I put the call to action? Where do I deliver the goods? What's going to be the best balance? Because there is, you know, it does hurt your channel a bit to send traffic off of YouTube. Uh, but, you know, it also hurts your channel not to have money so you can't buy new equipment and you have to go back and working, you know, as a stock, you know, stalker in a grocery store, you know, so you're going to hurt your channel either way, you know, you go there if, if that's the way you think about it. Uh, but I'm like, you know, I know that I can do this balance here and that I will produce great content. It's going to be paid for. I'll be able to, you know, pay all the bills. I'll be able to, you know, save money, be able to, you know, fund my retirement, all that fun stuff. And and yeah, I'm able to balance it. So, I mean, I, you want a specific number that's hard to do. Cause I've seen channels uh, that are vloggers that are getting, you know, a million views per video. And well, no, I think you, that, um, I think you, you gave a really good insight there about the watches because it's the type of, it's the type of com companies we need to work with. So if we're reviewing like $15 a month email software or something like, like one of our sponsors is, is Mailshake and they're a really great sponsor but they're not a hundred thousand dollar software platform. You know, like if, yeah. if we were promoting a conference and we're promoting something that's worth a lot more then we're just going to get more money for the same views. In general, I, I would say, you know, I find that the companies like some of the best companies, I mean, well, I'll just tell you that the, the finance industry, you know, I've worked with some of those guys and you know, there's a lot more money there simply because people spend a lot more money there and it's a reoccurring customer. If you're signing up for life insurance or something like that, and that's why in that space, it's sometimes so competitive, but I'm always, and I think that, but I think it's easy to, and I can say it's easy to get in there and, and separate yourself, but I've seen some people just go in recently and just kill it because they understand how to 
they just go out there and they're fearless and they create great videos. They're getting great views and they're getting some really nice level sponsorships, you know, $25,000 for a single video. And they're only getting 10 to 15,000 views on that video, but they're getting that site, that kind of money for that video because they're, they've, they've shown a history. Uh, the, the company can look, Oh, they've done a hundred videos and they're actually really good. This guy knows what he's talking about and his audience is consistent. And, you know, if they sign up for our, our insurance or our finance products, uh, you know, basically this guy would target people that have at least half a million dollars that they're putting into the stock market. If that's your audience, you know, that's a very valuable audience versus again, if you're creating videos for kids, uh, I've seen people there. I have a friend, she's got over a billion views. She's got one video that has over a hundred million views and they make $20,000 a month. You know, I, I mean, they make in almost all of its ad sets, and, but I mean, they're getting 50 times my views and they're not getting 50 times my revenue, not even close, uh, you know, and, but, but that's the path she chose. And that's, that's the nature of that beast. It is interesting. The different markets, one of my friends is health and wellness and he's barely like, I, I was matching his revenue. He's been doing it for two, three years. I think he has 250,000 subs. I was matching his revenue within like 30 days of starting on YouTube <laughs> because it's just consulting clients versus, you know, whatever, uh, ad sense, which was his main source of revenue. Yeah. So that's really interesting how, like, if you pick the wrong market, you can really mess yourself up. Well, I think it's probably that mindset of like, oh, you got to put in your time. You got to put in your, you got to put your head down and just make things happen. That's, ah, I, I don't, I don't go by that. You know, it's, there are people that can yeah. go in and get, they can, they can out think and they can find something that works and just go kill it. Cool. All right, Antonio, where is the best place for people to check you out online? Uh, they just type in Antonio Centeno, real men, real style. They'll find me. I've got tons of different things out there from, uh, you know, our Facebook, free Facebook page or group to uh, the YouTube channel. We've got a great community over there. Um, and if they want to meet me in person, we got our men influential conference so they can check that out. It's in Atlanta, Georgia. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to another episode. If you want more content like this, subscribe to the podcast. If you want more in-depth B2B sales training, of course, check out the YouTube channel, b2bsalestraining.org. And if you need marketing support for your digital agency, Experiment 27 helps digital agencies grow their number of leads by building lead generation systems. That is Experiment 27. Dot com. There's also notes on all the podcast episodes there and free sales courses, which we've gotten some very good feedback about. You can also check out my social media. I'm on Twitter, Alex Berman with no E, A-L-X Berman or Instagram, Alex Berman one. Till the next episode, I will see you later.